Hello everyone. Welcome back to Mastering GLSL in Touch Designer. My name is Lake Heckeman and I am your instructor for this course. I'm a new media artist exploring how technology alters human perception and changes the way that we connect with others. I do this through creating interactive exhibitions and immersive installations as well as kind of architectural facades and things like that. Here are some examples of work that I've created in the past, uh, weather reactive facade in Medellin, Colombia, a architectural data work in central China, several interactive exhibits during Art Basel, Miami, and uh, this interactive installation in New York City. So these are all done with GLSL and actually this one I wanted to call out specifically for today because this is using uh, the techniques that we're going to be talking about in our next several lessons uh, to kind of generate uh, a lot of the aesthetics here. So with that said, we are on to lesson number seven, basic noise. So we're finally getting into the good stuff. Um, from here on, I think it's going to be a lot more fun and a lot less, uh, let's say, tedious rote memorization. Um, so... That's great. Um, if you guys haven't followed along so far, all the other course, uh, all the other lessons are on my Patreon and you can get the exercise solutions there too. So uh, yeah, that is um, definitely what I recommend doing if you are new to shaders and just joining us. For those of you that are not, uh, well, let's jump into things. And as is customary, I'll talk about a few things uh, conceptually in our slides, and then I will move into the touch designer portion. All right, so what is noise? Um, I think everybody that is watching this video has probably used noise and seen it a lot. So this might be a little bit of a review, but basically procedural noise is going to be a way to generate random numbers in some sort of predictable manner. And that's going to let us create natural looking patterns and textures. And the really cool thing is by creating a function with some parameters that make it easy for us to tweak, we can really have a modular and quite functional system that we can write all in a GLSL shader. The other cool thing is that we can do all of this through a function that's known as an implicit definition. And what that means is it's a function that we're going to use to calculate a value at every point in our texture, which is great because it means that our texture can be resolution and aspect ratio independent, which is wonderful because one of the great things about Touch Designer is that it is very easy to take something and kind of adapt it from one screen setup to another and procedural uh, programming is, is very, it's the right word. Procedural programming is very powerful in the sense that it allows you to do this. And procedural noise is one very good tool in that toolbox. So this is just an example of like literally the touch designer basic noise. This black mass is uh, I think something everybody's probably familiar with. There's a bunch of different types of procedural noise. We're gonna look at a couple of them uh, today and then a couple more tomorrow, uh, or rather in our next lesson. And uh, well, I guess in the lesson after that too. Uh, but here are the main noises. We have random noise, value noise, Perlin noise, simplex noise, and cellular or whirly noise. Um, random noise is pretty self-explanatory. It's completely random. Uh, value noise is uh, basically just interpolating random noise across a grid, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, in just a second. And then Perlin and simplex noise kind of take that concept a couple levels further by uh, interpolating in different ways and also interpolating different values, um, which again, we're going to talk about in just a second. And then last but not least, uh, the topic of our next lesson, cellular and whirly noise is a little bit of a different paradigm, a different algorithm that leads to these really nice 
cellular shapes or Voronoi diagrams, which I am super excited to get to, but that is for next time. So for now, we'll just talk about how to implement noise in shaders. So basically, a lot of the randomness that we see in computer graphics is actually pseudo-random. And the reason for that is because it is generally something that is desirable to be able to deterministically arrive at the exact same values if you use the same inputs to a function. This is not always necessarily what we want, but in a lot of cases it is. And you can think about that as like, um, if we input the seed and we use like a seed for our noise shader, uh, we want to be able to recover the exact same pattern if we use that noise seed again. And if we use something that is actually random, like uh, OS generated random values, that is not going to be possible because they're actually random every frame. Um, with some caveats, but broadly speaking. Um, and so using a pseudo random function can allow us to achieve a lot of that same effect, but in a deterministic fashion. And so this pseudo random hashing function uh, is canonical. It's all over the internet and you'll see it many, many places. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what's going on in this long chain fract of sine of dot st dot xy with this vector and then this other weird magic number, uh, what we're basically doing is making, taking a sine wave of our current position scaled. So we're scaling our domain uh, with the dot product, then we're taking the sine of that value, and then we are further scaling the sine wave so that it's a very high frequency. And then we're just taking the fract, uh, the fractional component of whatever that value that's generated is, which is going to be uh, some value between zero and one. And by increasing the frequency very dramatically uh, for our sine function, we're able to pseudo generate uh, random values or values that appear random by using that function. So that's kind of like super random, uh, but super random is hard to work with. You know, it looks random. It looks like noise. There's not a lot of, of meaning there. And so what we want to do often is use those random values and, well, integrate, really. Um, integrate them in such a way that the patterns look more organic and nice and a little bit less like just absolute chaos uh, unstructured white noise. And so one of the good uh, techniques to do that, that we're going to be exploring a lot is what we're looking at here. And this should look pretty familiar, I think at this point, because we know all of these functions um, from our prior lessons. And so what we are doing in this example is basically taking a random value for every point on our curve. And then instead of just displaying that value, uh, super random, then we're instead interpolating between each of those values. And the cool thing is that we can interpolate between the two random numbers using like a smooth step function. Uh, and that can uh, lead to this very organic looking path, which is again, one dimensional, but um, already a lot more interesting and something that we may want to use as the basis for let's say like a animated motion arc in some sort of procedural scene that we're working on. So we're going to get into that in the touch designer portion, um, but just kind of conceptually, what we're going to be really doing in all of this lesson and the next several are generating random values and then kind of intelligently interpolating between them to make something look, well, good and interesting. Um, and I guess before I move on, I will say uh, I'm using some examples here from the Book of Shaders, which is a great resource. Um, so go check that out if you're interested in a little bit more in the weeds. I'm trying to keep this a nice mixture of conceptual, but also high level enough that we don't get too bogged down in the math and can focus a lot more on the implementation side of things in Touch Designer. So now kind of taking this idea and scaling it up to not just one dimension, but two dimensions, maybe three dimensions. What we are really doing um, is taking the random numbers on a grid and interpolating for every 
point on the grid, or really every point in between points on the grid, interpolating um, from four random values. And that's how we generate uh, value noise. So value noise is a direct interpolation of random numbers on a grid. So you can think of, let's say, a texture that might have like 100 by 100 pixels, and we can divide that into a grid that's 10 by 10, right? So every grid tile is going to have uh, also 10 by 10 pixels in it. And so for each one of those 10 by 10 pixels inside of this one tile, the noise value for each of those pixels will be a weighted average calculation of the noise values on each corner of that tile. Um, so, you know, if it was pixel four over two down, then it would be, you know, like 40% here, 60 or yeah, 40% here, 60% here, 20% up, 80% down. Um, and there would just be like a weighted average kind of similar to like a berry centric coordinate calculation that would determine what the actual pixel value is there. Um, Value noise is interesting. It looks a little boxy and kind of has a lot of artifacts. So it's more conceptually helpful for understanding what's going on. But we normally want to use simplex or Perlin noise because those are algorithmically optimized to have very few artifacts and they generally just look and perform a lot better. Um, so Perlin noise still uses a grid for interpolation, but um, instead of interpolating between the actual random values themselves, <coughs> excuse me, it is interpolating between random gradients on a grid. Um, and that algorithm was from Ken Perlin, the namesake of Perlin noise. And he actually then took that one step further and defined an entirely different grid known as a simplex grid, which is created from equilateral triangles instead of quads, because that is the most efficient way to partition uh, two-dimensional space. And so for this simplex noise, we are interpolating between random gradients on a simplex grid of equilateral triangles. Uh, again, these are not the most important for actually using these different noise functions, but I do think it's really helpful to understand what's going on under the hood and also kind of answer the question why simplex noise is the nice default noise that we see everybody using. Okay, so once we have kind of our noise function set up, then we have the ability to do some cool stuff. Um, and one of those things is manipulating noise. Now, in our last lesson, lesson we talked a lot about domain and how we can represent the pixels in our texture as an XY domain, and how we can further manipulate, transform, warp, rotate, etc. All of those, um, all of those XY pairs, which does some cool stuff, as we saw in our domain manipulation lesson. Now, all of that can be extended and added to our noise shaders as well, so we can translate the coordinate space that we use to look up our noise, we can scale that coordinate space. That is generally going to be known as like the period of the noise function. Uh, we can rotate our noise. We can also wrap the coordinate space or mirror it. And then we can warp, which is more advanced. And that's kind of defining a new coordinate for both our x and y uh, by using functions for the x and the y coordinate. Um, that last part is known as domain warping, and we will look at greater detail on that topic um, in later in this course or in the 201 module, uh, which will be after, uh, because it does get a little bit intense and yeah, it's just a little bit more advanced than, than we're at right now. But all of those domain manipulation functions do apply to the noise, and we'll take a look at all of that in our uh, touch designer setup. And then uh, last but not least, there is built-in functions that Touch Designer gives us in its GLSL environment. This will let us use some of these noise functions without implementing them ourselves, which is really nice. So we basically have TD Perlin noise and TD simplex noise that can take a VEC 2, 3, or 4 in each case and then passes out a float. 
So um, here I just have an example usage where we're assigning RGB values to uh, TD simplex noise. And I'm just using swizzling here uh, to sample slightly different coordinates uh, for the noise that is going to be assigned to each channel so that we have uh, different noise values for RGB. Um, and that is the end of our slides. So now I'm going to jump into Touch Designer. And we can see here kind of what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to be implementing all of these different noise functions that we talked about. And then I'll be going over the exercises. So thank you for everyone who's followed along so far. Um, after this, I'm going to be putting the rest of this lesson behind my Patreon paywall. Um, as I mentioned in the last course, thank you so much for everyone who is watching on YouTube. I really appreciate it. The reason that I'm putting the rest of this behind the paywall is because, well, I put a ton of work into creating these courses for everyone, and it means a lot to me that uh, those who are interested are able to have the best experience possible. And I can do that through my Patreon, uh, but I can't do that through just plain old YouTube. And so that's the decision process. I appreciate everyone who's going to be sticking with me. Um, if anybody happens to have uh, financial issues, just let me know, and I'm, I'm sure that we can work it out. Um, for anyone who is enjoying this and getting a lot out of it, thank you for the support. I appreciate it. And with that, let us begin. <laughs>